If you're listening to this, then you're listening to the latest production from the Laws of Misrule. We are an amateur dramatics group based at the Centre for Medieval Studies at the University of York. In between our studies and research, we usually put on at least three performances in the City of York throughout the year, with the goal of making medieval and early modern drama accessible and fun. At least, that's what we did. Yep. It was our hope that by this time we would have made a return to the stage. But as COVID-19 continues to impact life dramatically in the UK and beyond, our curtains remain closed. But we know better than anyone that the show must go on. And so we're very proud to bring you Ben Johnson's The Devil is an Ass, our second audio drama to be produced, directed and acted remotely. This production was produced by Ross McIntyre and co-directed and edited by me, Susanna Wise-Jackson, and by me, Nick Peard. This production would not have been possible without the efforts of our fantastic cast and crew. Together we have produced a wonderful and original adaptation of this oft-overlooked classic and proved once and for all that lords simply cannot be stopped, even when forced to remain apart. In lieu of the ticket fee, we usually ask, do an act of kindness, donate some money to a food bank, call a friend you haven't spoken to in a while, ask someone how they're doing and how you can help. The world feels a little bleak currently, but every act of human generosity is an act of hope. And we hope that by sharing this with you, we can bring a little levity where it might be needed. We'll let our characters get on with things, before it gets a little too serious in here. Narrators, take it away. The Devil is an Ass That is, today, the name of what you are met for, a new play. Yet, grandees, would you or not come to grace our matter with allowing us no place? Though you presume Satan a subtle thing, and may have heard he's worn in a thumb ring, do not on these presumptions force us act in compass of a cheese trencher. A cheese trencher? Are you sure? Yeah, it's what it says. See? Wow, okay. Um, where were we? Uh, this tract. Ah, yes. This tract will ne'er admit our vice because of yours. Anon, who worse than you the fault endures, that yourselves make when you are thrust and spurn, and knock us o'er the elbows and bid turn, as if, when we had spoke, we must be gone, or, till we speak, must all run in to one. Like the young adders at the old one's mouth, would we could stand due north or had no south, if that offend, or were Muscovy glass, that you might look our scenes through as they pass. We know not how to affect you, if you'll come to see new plays, pray you afford us room and show this but the same face you have done, your dear delight, the devil of Edmonton. Or if, for want of room it must miscarry, t'will be but justice that your censure tarry, till you give some, and when six times you have seen it, if this play do not like, the devil is in it. We begin our story in the depths of hell, where Satan, king of the dark, reigns supreme. Squirm of me! Maggot, you worm. Oh, I want to see you suffer, you piece of filth. His imps and demons long for the chance to prove their worth by wreaking havoc on earth, and the devil Pug is no exception. Having petitioned for his freedom, Satan responds. Ho, 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 ho. To earth? And why to earth, thou foolish spirit? What wouldst thou do on earth? For for that great chief, as time shall work, I do but ask my month, which every paddy, puny devil have. If in that term the court of hell will hear something, may gain a longer grant, perhaps. For what? The laming of a poor cow or two? Entering a sow to make her cast her farrow? Or crossing of a market woman's mare to its this and Tottenham? These ought to be your main achievements, pug, foolish fiend. Stay in your place, know your own strength, and put not beyond the sphere of your activity. You are too dull a devil to be trusted forth in those parts. Pug, a 
on any affair that may concern our name and home. This is not everyone's work. The state of hell must care whom it employs. In point of reputation, here about London. You would make, I think, an agent to be sent for Lancashire, proper enough, or uh, some part of Northumberland. So he'll have good instructions, Pug. Oh, Chief, you do not know, dear Chief, what there is in me. Prove me but for a fortnight, for a week, and lend me but a vice to carry with me practice there with any playfellow, and you will see, there will come more upon it than you'll imagine, precious chief. What vice? What kind wouldst thou have it of? Why, any fraud, or covetousness, or, or lady vanity, or old iniquity. I'll call him hither. Tis he called upon me, and would seem to lack a vice. Ere his words be half spoken, I'm with him in a trice. Here, there, and everywhere, as the cat is with the mice. True Thetus Iniquitas, lacks thou cards, friend, or dice? I'll teach thee, cheat child, to cog, lie, and swagger. And ever and anon to be drawing forth thy dagger. To swear by Gog's nouns like a lusty Juventus. In a cloak to thy heel and a hat like a painter. Thy breeches of three fingers and thy doublet o oh, belly. With a wench that shall feed thee with cockstones and jelly. Is it not excellent, chief? How nimble he is. <laughs> Of hell, this is nothing. I'll fetch thee a leap from the top of Paul's steeple to the standard in cheap, and lead a dance through the streets without fail, like a needle of spain with thread up my tail. We will survey the suburbs and make forth our sallies down Petticoat Lane and up the smock alleys to Shoreditch, Whitechapel, and so to St. Catharines. To drink with the Dutch there and take forth their patterns. From thence we'll put in a custom house key there and see how the factors and prentices play there, false with their masters, and geld many a full pack to spend it in pie at the dagger and the wolf sack. Brave, brave iniquity. Will not this do, Chief? Peace, dotard. Thou more ignorant thing, and so admirest. Art thou the spirit thou seemst? So poor to choose that this for a vice to advance the cause of hell? But, Pug, as the times are, who is it will receive you? What company will you go to, or who mix with? Where canst thou carry him except to tavern? He now will be admitted there, when Venom comes. He may perchance, in tale of a shepherd's dinner, skip with a rhyme at a table from you nothing, and take his almond leaf into a custard, shall make my lady mayoress and her sisters laugh all their hoods over their shoulders. But this is not that we'll do. There are other things that are received now upon earth for vices, stranger and newer, and changed every hour. They ride them like their horses off their legs, and here they come to hell, where whole legions of them every week tired. We still strive to breed, unless it be a vice of quality or fashion now they take none from us. Carmen are got into the yellow starch, and chimney sweepers their tobacco and strong waters hum we for opening. We 
must therefore aim at extraordinary succors now, when we do send to keep us in credit. But hug, since you do burn with such desire to do the Commonwealth of Hell some service, I am content. The shrooming of a body you go to earth and visit men a day. But you must take a body already made, Puck. I can create you none, nor shall you form yourself an airy one, but become subject to all impression of the flesh you take so far as humane frailty. So this morning there is a handsome cut purse hanged at Tyburn, whose spirit departed, you may enter his body, for clothes employ your credit of the hangman, or let our tribal brokers furnish you. And look how far your subtlety can work through those organs, with that body, spy amongst mankind. But as you make me your soon at night's relation, and we shall find it merits for the state, you shall have both trust from us and employment. <laughs> oh, most gracious chief, you are... Aha! Only thus more I bind you to serve the first man that you meet, and him I'll show you now. Observe him. Yon is he through this portal here. to write a letter of the utmost importance. Fetch me my quill. Follow me. But once engaged, there you must stay and fix, not shift until the midnight's cock do crow. Away then, through this portal. Go on, Pug. You can do it. I won't let you down. Farewell. I'll give him till the end of the day. I'd have said three hours, really. As Pug takes the body of that unfortunate cut purse, we find Fabian Fitzdoctoral in his office, hard at work on nothing, as usual. It's unclear if Fitzdoctoral has ever worked a day in his life. Self-absorbed, mean, and pompous to the core, it's no wonder the devil thinks him a suitable project for Pug. <sighs> I, they do now, name Bretnor as before. They talked of Gresham and of Dr. Foreman, Franklin and Fisker and Savory, he was in too. But there's not one of these that ever could yet show a man the devil in true sort. They have their crystals, I do know, and rings, and virgin parchment, and their dead men's skulls, their raven's wings, their lights and pentacles, with characters, I have seen all these. But, would I might see the devil? I would give a hundred of these pictures to see him, once out of picture. May I prove a cuckold? Ah, that's the one main mortal thing I fear. If I begin not now to think, the painters have only made him. Slice, he would be seen one time or other else. The best artists of Cambridge, Oxford, Middlesex and London, Essex and Kent, I have had in pay to raise him these fifty weeks, and yet appears not. Sdeath, I shall suspect they can make circles only shortly and no but his hard names. They do say he'll meet a man of himself that has a mind to him. If he would so, I have a mind and a half for him. He should not be long absent. Oh, pray thee come. I long for thee, and I were with child by him, and my wife too I could not more. Oh, come yet, good Beelzebub. Ugh! Were he a kind devil and had humanity in him, he would come, but to save one's longing. 
I should use him well, I swear, and with respect, would he would try me. You're not as the conjurers do when they have raised him. Get him in bonds and send him post on errands a thousand miles. It is preposterous, that. They do not know how to entertain the devil. I would so welcome him, observe his diet, get him his chambers hung with arras, two of them. In my own house, lend him my wife's wrought pillows. And as I am an honest man, I think, if he had a mind to her too, I should grant him to make our friendship perfect. So I would not to every man. If he but hear me now, and should come to me in a brave young shape, and take me at my word. Ha! Who is this? Sir, your good pardon that I thus presume upon your privacy. I am born a gentleman. A younger brother, but in some disgrace now with my friends, and want some little means to keep me upright while things be reconciled. Please you to let my service be of use to you, sir. Oh, no, friend, my number's full. I have one servant who is my all indeed, and from the broom unto the brush, for just so far I trust him. He is my wardrobe man, my cater, cook, butler, and steward looks unto my horse, and helps to watch my wife. He has all the places that I can think on, from the garret downward, e'en to the manger and the curry comb. Sir, I shall put your worship to no charge, more than my meat, and that is but very little. I'll serve you for your love. <laughs> Without wages? Well, I'll hearken a that here, were I at leisure. But, but now I'm busy. Uh, prithee, friend, forbear me. And thou hast been a devil, I should say, somewhat more to thee. Thou dost hinder now my meditations. Sir, I am a devil. How? A true devil, sir. Oh, nay, now you lie. Under your favour, friend, for I'll not quarrel. Your shoe's not cloven, sir. You are whole hooked. Sir, that's a popular error. Deceives many, but I am that I tell you. <laughs> What's your name? My name is... Uh, Devil, sir. Sayest thou true? Indeed, sir. Slid, there's some omen of this. What countryman? Of uh, Derbyshire, sir, about the peak. That hole belonged to your ancestors? Yes, Devil's arse, sir. Our man Fitzdottrell has had his wish for a devil granted, even though he doesn't realize it. And what he doesn't realize either is that there are men out to get him, and his money. Men who are entirely too clever for their own good. We see them now, coming up to the house of Fitzdottrell. Engine, Manly, and Whittapool. Mere craftsmen. Jolly walk, sir. I'll go let him for you now. What say you, Whittapool? To him, good engine, raise him up by degrees, gently, and hold him there too, you can do it. Show yourself now a mathematical rope. <laughs> I'll warrant you for half of these. Is it possible that there should be such a man as Fitz Dottrell? You shall be your own witness. I'll not labour to tempt you past your faith. And his wife is uh, so very handsome, say you? <sighs> I have not seen her since I came home from travel. And they say she is not altered. Then, before I went, I saw her once. But so, and she hath stuck still in my view, no object hath removed her. Tis a fair guest, friend, beauty. Once lodged deep in the eye, she hardly leaves the inn. How does Fitzdottrell keep her? Oh, very brave. However, himself be sordid, he is sensual in that way. In every dressing, he does study her. Talking of... How does he furnish himself? From the broker? Oh, yes. That's a hired suit I would venture he now has on. To see the devil is an ass today in. He dares not miss a new play, or a feast, what rate soever clothes be at, and thinks himself so new, in other men's old. I intend to get this cloak here upon him. You and I shall go now. 
We'll see you later, Injun. Will you come fetch the old fool soon, after the next stage? I shall. I go to meet with Magrov now, who has a cunning plan afoot. I'll entertain him for the namesake, huh? And turn away my t'other man and save four pound a year by that. There's luck and thrift too. The very devil may come here after as well. Friend, I receive you, but with all, I acquaint you aforehand. If you offend me, I must beat you. It is a kind of exercise I use and cannot be without. Yes, if I do not offend, you can sure. But, sir, I really am Fate, a devil. Fate, devil, very hardly. I'll call you by your surname, because I love it. Ah, the gentleman Whittipole and Manly, welcome. Oh, what a fair garment, by my faith. It was never made, sir, for three score pound, I assure you. T'will yield thirty. The plush, sir, costs three pound ten shillings a yard. And then the lace and velvet. Mm, I shall be looked at prettily in it. Uh, is the play played today? Oh, here's the bill, sir. And will your good wife be joining you today? No, uh, uh, which of you is it so mere idolater to my wife's beauty and so very prodigal unto my patience that for the short parley of one swift hour's quarter with my wife he will depart with... Uh, <laughs> Let me see, uh, th this cloak here. Sir, who asks about my wife? Uh, are you the man? I am that venturer, sir. And has told me you have travelled lately. That I have, sir. <laughs> Truly, uh, your travels may have altered your complexion, but sure, your wit stood still. And it may be well, sir. All heads are not like growths. Well, to the point... "'Tis only, sir, you say, to speak unto my wife? "'Only to speak to her. "'And in my presence? "'In your very presence. "'And in my hearing? "'In your hearing, so you interrupt us not. "'For the short space you do demand, the fourth part of an hour, "'I think I shall, with some convenient study "'and this good help to boot, bring myself to it. "'I ask no more. Speak what you list, that time is yours, my right I have departed with. But not beyond a minute, or a second look for, length and drawing out may advance much to these matches, and I accept all kissing. Kisses are silent petitions still with willing lovers. Sir, I must condition to have Manly by a witness. <laughs> well, I am content, so he be silent. Yes, sir, of course. Come, devil, I'll make your room straight, but I'll show you first your mistress, who's no common one. You must conceive that brings this gain to see her. I hope thou'st brought me good luck. I shall do it, sir. You hope your half peace. Tis there, sir. I am directly in a fit of wonder. What will be the issue of this conference? For that, never vex yourself till the event. How you like him? <laughs> I would fain see more of him. What do you think of this? I am past degrees of thinking. Old Afric and the new America, with all their fruited monsters, cannot show so just a prodigy. Could have believed without your sight a mind so sordid inward should be so specious and laid forth abroad to all the show that every shop or where was. I believe anything now, though I confess his vices are the most extremities I ever knew in nature. But have ye faith that he will hold his bargain? Oh, dear sir, he will not off it. Fear him not, I know him. One baseness still accompanies another. If I freely can discover what would please me in my lover, I would have her fair and witty, savouring more of court than city. 
a little proud but full of pity, light and humorous in her toying, oft building hopes and soon destroying, long but sweet in the enjoying, neither too easy nor too hard, all extremes I would have barred. She should be allowed her passions, so they were but used as fashions, sometimes froward and then frowning, sometimes sickish and then swowning, every fit with change still crowning. Purely jealous I would have her, then only constant when I crave her, tis a virtue should not save her. Thus, nor her delicates would cloy me, neither her peevishness annoy me. And so, later that day, we find Fitzdoctoral instructing his young wife on the task ahead. Francis is young, but probably one of the most long-suffering wives in the world. Come, wife, make ready for the gentleman. Nay, blush not. Why? What do you mean, sir? Have you your reason? Why? I do not know that I have lent it forth to any one, at least without a pawn, wife. Or that I have eat or drunk the thing, wife, of late, that should corrupt it. Wherefore? Gentle wife, obey! It is thy virtue. Hold no acts of disputation. Are you not enough? They talk of feasts and meeting, but you still make argument for fresh? Why, careful wedlock, if I have a longing to have one tale more go of me, what is that to thee, dear heart? Why shouldst thou envy my delight, or, or cross it, by being solicitous when it not concerns thee? Yes, I have share in this. This scorn will fall as bitterly on me where both are laughed at. Laugh at, sweet bird? Is that the scruple? Come, come. Here is a cloak cost fifty pound, wife, which I can sell for thirty when I have seen all London in't, and London has seen me. Today I go to the Black Friars Playhouse, sit in the view, salute all my acquaintance, rise up between the acts, let fall my cloak, publish a handsome man and a rich suit, as that's a special end why we go thither, all that pretend to stand for it on the stage. The ladies ask, who's that? For they do come to see us, love, as we do to see them. Now I shall lose all this for the false fear of being laughed at. Yes, worse. Let em laugh, wife. Let em have such another cloak tomorrow, and let em laugh again, wife, and again. And then grow fat with laughing, and then fatter. All my young gallants, let em bring their friends too. Shall I forbid em? No, let heaven forbid em, or wit if it have any charge on em. C come, thy ear, wife, is all I'll borrow of thee. Good husband, I must prove... The gentlemen have returned, sir. Now, wife, thou only art to hear, not speak a word, dove, to aught he says. That I do give you in precept. No less than counsel on your wifehood, wife, not though he flatter you, or make court, or love, as you must look for these. Or say, he rail, whate'er his arts be, wife, I will have thee delude em with a trick, thy obstinate silence. I know advantages, and I love to hit these pragmatic young men with their own weapons. Wife? Ah, playing the game already, I see. <sighs> the gentleman Whittapole and Manly, sir? Ah! Gentlemen, my good Whittapole, is your watch ready? I'll set it, sir, with yours. <sighs> the sweet Mrs. Fitzdotterell. Her modesty seems to suffer with her beauty, and so, as if his folly were away, it were worth pity. You what? Now, that's right. 
begin, sir. But first, let me repeat the contract briefly. <clears throat> I am, sir, to enjoy this cloak I stand in freely and as your gift upon condition you may as freely speak here to my spouse your quarter of an hour, always keeping the measured distance of your yard or more from my said spouse in my sight and hearing. This is your covenant. But you'll allow for this time spent now. Set him so much back. I think I shall not need it. Well, begin, sir. Uh, 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 there is your bound, sir. Not beyond that rush. If you interrupt me, sir, I shall discloak you. <clears throat> the time that I have purchased, lady, is but short. And therefore... If I employ it thriftily, I hope I stand the nearer to my pardon. I am not here to tell you you are fair or lovely, or how well you dress, lady. I'll save myself that eloquence of your glass which can speak these things better to you than I. And tis a knowledge wherein fools may be as wise as court parliament. Nor come I with any prejudice or doubt that you should, to the notice of your own worth, need least revelation. That you are the wife to so much blasted flesh as scarce hath soul, instead of salt to keep it sweet, I think will ask no witnesses to prove. The coal sheets that you lie in with the watching candle that sees, how dull to any thaw of beauty, pieces and quarters, half and whole night sometimes. The devil given elfin squire, your husband doth leave you, quitting here his proper circle for a much worse in the walks of Lincoln's Inn. Under the elms to expect the fiend in vain, there will confess for you. I did look for this gear. And what a daughter of darkness he does make you, locked up from all society or object, your eye not let to look upon a face as I now make, your own too sensible sufferings without the extraordinary aids of spells or spirits may assure you, lady. For my part, I protest against all such practice. I work by no false arts, medicines or charms to be said forward and backward. No, I accept. Sir, I shall ease you. Hm. Nor have I ends, lady, upon you more than this, to tell you how love, beauty's good angel, he that waits upon her at all occasions and no less than fortune, helps the adventurous. In me makes that proffer, which never fair one was so fond to lose, who could but reach a hand forth to her freedom? From the first sight I loved you, since which time, though I have travelled, I have been in travel more for this second blessing of your eyes, which I have now purchased than for all aims else. If love and fortune will take care of us, why should our will be wanting? This is all. What do you answer, lady? Now the sport comes. Let him still wait, 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 while the watch goes and the time runs, wife. How? Not any word. Nay, then I taste a trick in it. Worthy lady, I cannot be so false to mine own thoughts of your presumed goodness to conceive this as your rudeness, which I see is imposed. Yet since your jailer here stands by you and you are denied the liberty of the house, let me take warrant, lady, from, from your silence, which I therefore interpret as consent, to make your answer for you, which shall be to as good purpose as I can imagine, and what I think you'd speak. <clears throat> My dear Sir Whittaker... No, no, I no, shall, no. Uh, I shall resume, sir. One interruption more, sir, and you go into your hose and doublet. Nothing saves you. And therefore, hearken. This is for your wife. <clears throat> Troth, sir, tis more than true that you have uttered of my unequal and so sordid match here. With all the circumstances of my bondage. 
I have a husband and a two-legged one, but such a moonlick as no wit of man or roses can redeem from being an ass. But, sir, you seem a gentleman of virtue, no less than blood, and one that every way looks as he were of too good quality to entrap a credulous woman or betray her, since you have paid thus dear, sir, for a visit and, and made such venture on your wit and charge merely to see me or at most to speak to me. I were too stupid or what's worse ingrate not to return your venture. My husband is to go to a new play today, sir, from whence no fear, no, nor authority, scarcely the king's command, sir, will restrain him. Now you have fitted him with a stage garment, for, for the mere name's sake were there no things else, and many more such journeys he will make, which, if they now or any time hereafter offer us opportunity, you hear, sir, who be as glad and forward to embrace, meet and enjoy it cheerfully as you. Oh, I humbly thank you, lady. <laughs> Keep your ground, sir. By this sad contract, I will thus take my leave of you. This so envious distance, I had thought our lips ere this, to seal the happy mixture made of our souls. But we must both now yield to the necessity. Do not think yet, lady, but I can kiss and touch and laugh and whisper and do those crowning courtships too, for which day and the public have allowed no name, but now my bargain binds me. For rude injury, to importune more, or urge a noble nature to what of its own bounty it is prone to, else I should speak. But lady, I love so well, as I will hope you'll do so too. I have done, sir. Well then, I won. Sir. And I may win too. Oh yes, oh yes, no doubt on't. I'll take careful order that she shall hang forth ensigns at the window to tell you when I am absent. Or, or, or I'll keep three or four footmen ready still of purpose to run and fetch you at her longing, sir, to bring you I together at her lodging under pretext of teaching her my wife some rare receipt of drawing almond milk. Ha! It shall be part of my care, good sir. God be with you. I have kept the contract, and the cloak is mine own. Oh, why? Much good do it you, sir. If it may fall out that you had bought it dear, though I had not sold it. A pretty riddle. Fare you well, good sir. Deville, see these gentlemen out. Now, wife, uh, sits this fair cloak the worse upon me for my great sufferings, or your little patience? <laughs> Do they laugh, you think? Oh, I, sir, and you might see it. What thought they have of you may be soon collected by the young gentleman's speech. Young gentleman? Death, you are in love with him, are you? Could he not be named the gentleman without the young? Go, up to your cabin again. My cage you were best to call it. Yes, sing there, I know you. Go get you up. Oh. Here is one engine, sir. Desires to speak with you. I thought he brought some news of a broker. My good sir, that I do. Oh, my fine engine. What's the fare? More cheats? No, sir. The wit, the brain, the great projector. I taught you all. It's me when come to town. Where, engine? I brought him. Ere he put off his boots, sir. But... What is a projector? Why? One that projects ways to a rich man, or to make him great, by suits, by marriages, by undertakings. According as he sees, they humour it. Uh, can he not conjure at all? I think he can, sir. You do not know, sir, what he has, and by what arts. A money man, sir, and is as great with your almanac man as you are. Is he gallant? Sir, you shall see. He's in his riding suit, as he comes now from court. But hear him speak. Minister matter to him, and then tell me. 
Then let us go at once. Uh, not you, devil. You stay here. But... Uh, stay! And mind the lady upstairs. Your mistress is a fruit that's worth the stealing, and therefore worth the watching. Be you sure now you have all your eyes about you, and let in no lace woman nor board that brings French masks and cutworks. See you? Nor old crones with wafers to convey letters. Nor no youths disguised like country wives with cream and marrow puddings. Much knavery may be vented in a pudding, much bawdy intelligence. They are shrewd ciphers. Uh, nor turn the key to any neighbour's need, be it but to kindle fire or beg a little. Put it out, rather, all out, to an ash, that they may see no smoke. Or water, spill it, knock of the empty tube, that by the sound they may be forbid entry. I'll take care, sir. They should not trouble you if they would. <laughs> Sir Money's a whore, a bored, a drudge, fit to run out on errands. Let her go via pecunia when she's run and gone and fled and dead. Then will I fetch her again with aqua vitae out of an old hog's head. <laughs> and here we have Meercraft. There's a reason he's in control, conniving. Cunning and sneaky, there's no stoop too low for the perfect scam. And poor Fitz Dottrell is about to be dragged along for the ride. I would but see the creature, the man, the prince indeed, that could employ so many millions as I would help him to. How talk you? Millions? Fitz Dottrell, sir, you are a gentleman of a good presence, a handsome man. I have considered you as a fit stock to graft honours upon. I have a project to make you a duke now, that you must be one within so many months as I set down out of true reason of state. You shall not avoid it, but you must hearken then. <laughs> hearken? Why, sir, do you doubt his ears? Alas, Magrath, you do know Master Fitch Dottrell? He does not know me indeed. I thank you, Injun, for rectifying him. Good. Why, Injun, then I'll tell it you. He shall be but an undertaker with me in a most feasible business. It shall cost him nothing except he please but countenance that I will have to appear in it to great men for which I'll make him one. He shall not draw a string of his purse. I'll drive his patent for him. We'll take in citizens, commoners, and older men to bear the charge and blow them off again. Like so many dead flies, when tis carried, the thing is for recovery of a drowned land. Were of the crowns to have a moiety, if it be owner, as the crown and owners to share that moiety, and the recoverers to enjoy the other moiety for their charge. Throughout England? Yes, which will rise to 18 millions, seven the first year. I've computed all and made my survey unto my acre. I'll begin at the pan, not at the skirts, as some have done. I'll have it all. A gallon tract of land it is. Twill yield a pound an acre. We must let chief have her at first. The drowned land, if it will do as you say. Then take one proposition more, and hear it as past exception. What's that? To be duke of those lands you shall recover. Take your title thence, sir, duke of the drowned lands, or drowned land. Ah, <laughs> that last has a good sound. I like it well. The duke of drowned land. Yes, it goes like Grunland, sir. 
if you work it. I, in drawing thus your honor from the work, you make the reputation of that greater and stayeth the longer in your name. Hmm, it is true. Drowned lands will live in drowned lands. Uh, sir, th there's not place to give you demonstration of these things. They are a little too subtle. But I could show you such a necessity in it that as you must be. What you please against the received heresy that England bears no dukes. Keep you the land, sir. The greatness of the estate shall throw it upon you. If you like better turning it to money, what may not you, sir, purchase with that wealth? Say you should part with oh, two of your millions to be the thing you would. Who would not do it? As I protest, I will, out of my dividends, lay for some petty principality in Italy from the church. Uh, now, you perhaps fancy the smoke of England, rather. <laughs> but, sir, your good wife, are her manners fit for the station of a duchess? I... well... yeah. I, I mean, that is to say, she would be ready when the time comes. Yes. Ah, in which case I can recommend my Lady Tailbush. Injun, tell her I am come from court this morning. Say I have got our business moved, and well, entreat her that she give you the four score angels, and see him disposed of to my council. Sir Paul Iverside. Uh, sometime today I'll wait upon her ladyship with the relation. Of course, sir. Now, sir, let me tell you about another business of mine. They call it a pyramid scheme, see? Is that a square-based or triangle-based pyramid scheme? While Fitzdoctoral is being spun a merry yarn by Miracraft and his crony Injun, Pug remains at the house, bored and desperate for the chance to prove his worth as a masterclass demon. Surely a stifled housewife would make a perfect target for a little bit of tempting. <sighs> I have no singular service of this now, nor no superlative master. I shall wish to be in hell again at leisure. My chief is in the right. Can any fiend boast of a better vice than here by nature and art the owners of? My first act now shall be to make this master of mine cuckold. The primitive work of darkness I will practice. I will deserve so well of my fair mistress. By my discoveries first, my counsels after, and keeping counsel after that. As whosoever is one, I'll be another sure. I'll have my share, most delicate damned flesh. She will be, oh, but I could stay time now. Midnight will come too fast upon me, I fear, to cut my pleasure. Look at the back door. One knocks. See who it is. Dainty she-devil. Cannot get this venture of the cloak out of my fancy, nor the gentleman's way he took, which, though twas strange, Yet t'was handsome, and had a grace withal beyond the newness. Sure he will think me the dull stupid creature he said, and might conclude it. If I find not some thought to think the tale, would he presume by all the carriage of it on my brain for answer, and will swear tis very barren, if it can yield him no return. Oh, who is it? <coughs> Mistress, it is... But first, let me assure the excellence of mistresses. I am, although my master's man, my mistress' slave, the servant of her secrets and sweet turns, and know what fitly will conduce to either. What's this? I pray you come to yourself and think what your part is, to make an answer. Tell who is at the door. The gentleman, mistress. Who was at the cloak charge to speak with you this morning? Who expects only to take some small commandments from you? What you please, worthy your form, he says, and gentlest manners. Oh, you'll an 
prove these headmen I fear what he has given you for this message. Sir, bid him put off his hopes of straw and leave to spread his nets and few thus. Though they take your master for his doctoral, I am no such fool, nor fair one. Tell him we'll be ahead with stalking, and wish him to forbear his acting to me at the gentleman's chamber window in Lincoln's Inn there that opens to my gallery. Else I swear to acquaint my husband with his folly, and leave him to the just rage of his offended jealousy. Or, if your master's sense be not so quick to write me, tell him I shall find a friend that will repair me. Say I will be quiet in my own house. Pray you, in this words, give it him. <sighs> this is some fool turned. He be the master now of that stake and wit which I allow him. Sure, he will understand me. I do not know more direct. For this officious fellow, my husband's new groom, a spy upon me, I find already. Yet if he but tell him this in my words, he cannot but conceive himself both apprehended and requited. I would not have him think he made a statue or spoke to one. Not there, though I was silent. How now? Have you told him? Yes. And what says he? Says he? That which myself would say to you, if I durst, that you are proud, sweet mistress, and withal a little ignorant to entertain the good that's proffered, and by your beauty's leave not also wise as some true politic wife will be, who, having matched with such a nupson, and I speak here with my master's peace, uh, whose face hath left to accuse him, now for to doth confess him, what you can make him will yet, out of scruple and a spiced conscience, defraud the poor gentleman? At, at least delay him in the thing he longs for, and make it his whole study, how to compass only a title. Could but he write cuckold if he had his hands? For, look, oh, you... this can be none but my husband's wit. What do you mean, my precious mistress? The groom never durst be else so saucy. If it were not clearly his worshipful ambition, and the top of it, the very forked top too, why should he keep you thus murred up in a back room, mistress? It is fear of engendering by the eyes with gallants. He forbids you paper, pen, and ink like ratsbane. Will you make the benefit of truth, dear mistress? If I do tell it you, I do it not often. I am set over you employed indeed to watch your steps, your looks, your very breathing, and to report them to him. Now, if you will be a true, right, delicate, sweet mistress, why, we will make a coax of this wise master. We will, my mistress, an absolute fine coax, and mock to air all the deep diligences of such a solemn and effectual ass, an ass so good purpose as will use him, I will contrive it so I'll convey your letters, fetch answers, do you all the offices that can belong to your blood and beauty, and, for the variety at my time, although I am not in due symmetry for the man of that proportion, or in rule of physic of the just complexion, or of that truth of Picardil and clothes to boast a sovereign to your ladies, yet I know to do my turn, sweet mistress, come, kiss. How oh, now? Dear, delicate, sweet mistress, I am your slave, your little worm that loves you, your fine monkey, your dog, your jack, your, your pug that longs to be stilled. Oh. Hey, all this, sir, pray you, come from your standing. Do a little spare yourself, sir, from your watch to applaud your squire that so well follows Oof. your instructions. <laughs> How now, sweetheart? Ah. What's the matter? Good. You set not your saucy devil here to tempt your wife, who with all the insolent, uncivil language or action he could invent? Did you so, devil? Uh, well, uh, not you. Uh, you were not planted in your home to hear him upon the stairs, or here behind the hangings. I do not know your qualities. 
Does he just do it? Can you not give directions? You shall see, wife. You most mere rogue! You open Oof. manifest villain! Yeah. You fiend apparent you! You declared hellhound! Good sir, please! Good knave, good rascal, and good traitor! Now I do find you parcel devil indeed! Upon the point of trust, your first charge, the very day of your probation, to tempt your mistress. You do see, good wedlock, how I directed him. Why, where, sir, were you? Nay, there is one blow more for exercise. Oh. I told you I should do it. What you had done, sir. Out of my sight. If thy name were not devil, thou shouldst not stay a minute with me. In, go. Yet stay. Yet go, too. I am resolved what I will do. And you shall know it forehand. Soon as the gentleman is gone, do you hear? I'll help your lisping. I'll give you a lisping in a minute. Out! What, what gentleman is this you speak of? Why, such a man, wife. He has such plots. He will make me a duke, no less by heaven. Six mares to your coach, wife. That's your proportion. And your coachman bald, because he shall be bare enough. <laughs> Do not you laugh. We are a-looking for a place, and all in the map what to be of. Have faith, be not an infidel. You know I am not easy to be gulled. I swear, when I have my millions, else I'll make another duchess, if you have not faith. <laughs> you have too much, I fear, in these false spirits. Spirits? Oh, no such thing, wife. Wit, mere wit. This man defies the devil in all his works. He dost by engine and devises he. He has his winged ploughs that go with sails, will plough you forty acres at once, and mills will spout you water ten miles off. All Crowland is ours, wife, and the fens, from us in Norfolk to the utmost bounds of Lincolnshire. We have viewed it and measured it within all, by the scale, the richest tract of land, love, in the kingdom. There will be made seventeen or eighteen millions, or, or more, as may be handled. Wherefore, think, sweetheart, if thou hast a fancy to one place more than another to be duchess of, now name it. I will hat whatever it costs, if it will be had for money, either here or in France or, or Italy. <laughs> you have strange fantasies. A surly pug, kicked out on his arse, wanders the streets and tries to plot his revenge. Sure he will geld me if I stay, or worse, pluck out my tongue, one of the two. This fool, there is no trusting of him, and to quit him were a contempt against my chief past pardon. It was a shrewd disheartening this at first. Who would have thought a woman so well harnessed? or rather well caparisoned indeed, that wears such petticoats and lace to her smocks, broad seeming laces as I see em hang there, and garters which are lost if she can show em, could have done this. Hell, why is she so brave? It cannot be to please Duke Dotteral, sure, nor the doe pictures in her gallery. Yet that may be, I have known many of them begin their pleasure, but none end it there, that I consider as I go along with it. They may, for want of better company, or that they think the better, spend an hour, two, three, or four discoursing with their shadow. But sure, they have a farther speculation. No woman, dressed with so much care, and study doth dress herself in vain. I'll vex this problem a little more. Before I leave it, sure. Little does Pug know that the perfect opportunity for that sweet revenge is just around the corner. This was a queen. I had thought above that this thing should prove her chamber, which I feared would be my greatest trouble. This is Belinda, 
and that's the room. Yeah, it, it is. I now remember. I have often seen there a woman. I never marked her much. How now? What's this? Where was your soul, friend? Babe, now and then a wake undo those objects. You pretend so. Let me not live if I am not in love more with her wit for this direction now than with her form, though I had prayed that pretty since I saw her in you today. Frances, bewailing her lot, just so happens to open her window at that moment to get some fresh air or to look out on the city that she is locked away from. Who knows? But at that moment, her suitor spots her. Right, she's here! Uh, either he understood him not, or else the fellow wasn't faithful in delivery of what I had. And I am justly paid that might have made my profit of his service, but by mistake and have drawn on his envy, and done the worst defeat upon myself. Oh, is it so? Is there the interview? Have I drawn to you at last, my cunning lady? The devil is an ass, fooled off and beaten, nay, made an instrument, and could not scent it. Well, since you have shown the malice of a woman, no less than her true wit and learning, mistress, I'll try if little Pug have the malignity to recompense me, and so save his danger. Tis not the pain, but the discredit of it. The devil should not keep a body entire. Away, manly! Fall back, she comes! I'll leave you, sir. Good luck. <laughs> Mistress! <gasps> oh, you, you make me paint, sir. They're fair colours, lady, and natural. I did receive some commands from you lately, gentle lady. But so perplexed and wrapped in the delivery, as I may fear to have misinterpreted. But must make suit still, to be near your grace. I wonder what old Fitzdotter would think about this. I'll steal myself away for now, and let him know his wife has a visitor. Sir, if you judge me by the simple action, and by the outward habit and complexion of easiness, it has to your design. You may with justice say I am a woman, and a strange woman. But when you shall please to bring but that concurrence of my portion to memory, which today you self did urge, it may beget some favour like excuse, though none like reason. No, my tuneful mistress. Then surely love hath none, nor beauty any, nor nature violenced in both these. With all whose gentle tongue you speak at once. I thought I had enough removed already that scruple from your breast and left you all reason. When through my morning's perspective I shewed you a man so above excuse as he is the cause. Why anything is to be done upon him and nothing called an injury misplaced. I rather now had hoped to shew you how love by his accesses grows more natural. And what was done this morning with such force was but devised to serve the present then. That since love hath the honour to approach, could play the hopping sparrow about these nets, and sporting squirrel in these crisped groves, bury himself in every silkworm's kell, if here unravelled, run into the snare which every hair is cast into a curl, Cupid flying, bathe himself in milk and roses here and dry him there, warm his cold hands to play with this smooth and... Uh, uh, enough of that, thank you. <clears throat> Inside the Fitzdotterel house, meanwhile, an erstwhile pug steals back into his master's good graces. Devil, this had best not be some new ploy. No, sir. Look. Is she so, sir? D and I will keep her so, if I know how, or, or can. That wit of man will do it. I'll go no farther. And our young lovers are well and truly screwed. Oi! Ah! Oh, husband, 
dearest. Oh. Get you away from there. You. Yes. Me. At this window, she shall no more be buzzed at. Take your leave on it. If you be sweet meat, wedlock, or sweet flesh, all's one. I do not love this hum about you. A fly-blown wife is not so proper. For you, sir, look to hear from me. There's no man offers this to my wife but pays for that it. That have I, sir. Nay, then, I tell you, you are. What am I, sir? Why, that I'll think on. But when I have cut your throat... Go, you are an ass. I am resolved on it, sir. Yeah, I think you are. I will call you to a reckoning. Away, you broker's block. You property. Slight, if you strike me... I'll strike your mistress. Stop, no! Oh, I could shoot mine eyes at him for that now. Or leave my teeth in him where they cuckolds bane enough to kill him. Oh, what prodigious, blind, and most wicked change of fortune's this. I have no air of patience. Oh, my veins swell and my sinews start at the iniquity of it. Hmm. Oh, bird, could you do this against me? A and at this time now? When I was so employed, wholly for you, drowned in my care, more than the land I swear I have hoped to win, to make you peerless, studying for footmen for you, fine-paced wishes, pages to serve you of the knee, with what knight's wife to bear your train, and sit with your four women in council and receive intelligences from foreign parts, to dress you at all pieces. You have, a most, turned my good affection to you, soured my sweet thoughts, all my pure purposes. I could now find, in my very heart, to make another lady duchess and depose you. Devil, you have redeemed all. I do forgive you, and I'll do you good. I thank you, my good sirs. You are an awful little devil. This for the malice of it, and my revenge may pass. But now my conscience tells me I have profited the cause of hell but little in the breaking of their loves, which, if some other act of mine repair not, I shall hear ill of in my account. On Giles and Joan Who says that Giles and Joan at discord be? The deserving neighbours no such mood can see. Indeed, poor Giles repents he married ever, but that his Joan doth too. And Giles would never, by his free will, be in Joan's company, nor more would Joan he should. Giles riseth early, and having got him out of doors is glad, the like is Joan. But turning home is sad, and so is Joan. Oft times when Giles doth find harsh sights at home, Giles wishes he were blind, all this doth Joan. Or that his long-yearned life were quite outspun, the like wish half his wife. The children that he keeps, Giles, swear are none of his begetting, and so swears his Joan. In all affections she concurreth still. If now, with man and wife, to will and nil the self-same things a note of concord be, I know no couple better can agree. We now find Mirrorcraft and Engine awaiting Fitzdotterel at a local pub. If you thought the other schemes were weird, just wait until you hear this one. Right, yes, good. And when we've got that sucker right where we want him, Engine, you'll go and... Well, why have you these excursions? Where have you been, sir? Well, I have been vexed a little with a toy. 
Oh, sir, no, no toys must trouble your gray bed. Now it is growing to be so great. You must be above all those things. Nay, nay, so I will. Fetch this man a drink. Now you are to our the Lord, sir. You must put off the man, sir. He says true. Hmm. Yes. Just to be clear, he's got no idea what man they're referring to. Nope. Not at all. You must do nothing, as you have done it heretofore. Not know or salute any man. Especially if he was your backfellow the other month. The other month? Nay, the other week. Thou dost not know the privileges, Injun. Follow that title, nor how swift. Today, when he has put on his lord's face once, then... Sir, for these things I shall do well enough. There is no fear of me. Uh, but then my wife is such an untoward thing. She'll never learn how to comport with it. I am out of all conceit. On her behalf. Best have her taught, sir. Where? Are there any schools for ladies? <laughs> Is there an academy for women? My good Magrat, do you remember the conceit you had of the Spanish gown at home? I don't follow. You know, the Spanish gown? No, I still don't follow. You know, the Spanish gown that belonged to a Spanish lady? <laughs> I do thank thee with all my heart, de Injun. My good Fitzdottle, sir, there is a certain lady here about the town, an English widow who have lately travelled, and she's called the Spaniard because she came latest from thence and keeps the Spanish habits. Such a rare woman. All our women here that are of spirit and fashion flock unto her as to their president, their law, their canon. And such a mistress of behavior, she knows from the duke's daughter to the doxy what is their due just and no more. Oh, sir, you please me in this more than my own greatness. Where is she? Let us have her. By your patience. We must use means, Cass, how to be acquainted. Good. Sir, about it. We must think how first. Oh, I do not love to tarry for a thing when I have a mind to it. You do not know me if you do offer it. Steady now, my lord. Your wife must send some pretty token to her, with a compliment and pray to be received in her good graces. All the great ladies do it. Oh, she shall, she shall. What were it best to be? Some little toy. Oh, not have it be any great matter, sir. Let's say a diamond ring of uh, 40 or 50 pound uh, would do it handsomely and be a gift fit for your wife to send and her to take. I'll go and tell my wife on straight. I... I don't believe it. Why, this is all well, the clothes we have now. But where's this lady? If we could get a witty boy now, Injun, that were an excellent crack. I could instruct him to the true heights. For anything takes this daughter. Why, sir? You best will be one of the players. No, there's no trusting them. They'll talk on it and tell their poets. What if they do? The jest will book the stage. But there be some of them, are very honest lads. There is Dick Robinson, a very pretty fellow, and comes often to a gentleman's chamber, a friend of mine. We had the merriest supper of it there. One night, the gentleman's landlady invited him to a gossip feast. Now he, sir, brought Dick Robinson, dressed like a lawyer's wife, among them all. I let him play. But to see him behaving, and lay the law, and cough, and drink unto him, and he talks bowdy, and sent frolics, oh, it would have burst your buttons, or not left you a seam. They say he's an ingenious youth. Oh, sir, and dresses himself the best, beyond forty of your very ladies. Did you never see him? No, I do seldom see those toys. 
But think you, we may have him. Sir, the young gentleman, I tell you, can't command him. Shall I attempt it? Yes. Do it. Note for Mr. Meercraft. Here. A note from Mr. Fitzdoctoral, sir. My, that was quick. <clears throat> Slight, I cannot get my wife uh, to part with a ring on any terms, and yet the sullen monkey has it too. I eagerly await your next instruction, yours, Lord Fitzdoctoral. <laughs> you shall have credit, sir. I'll send a ticket unto my goldsmith. Uh, have you a quill, Injun? Here, sir. Any news of my cousin? Your cousin Admiral met me and has beat me because I would not tell him where you were. I think he has docked me to the house too. Tell Fitzdoddle to meet with us at Guildheads. We shall see about that ring. And so we find ourselves at the premises of Guildhead the Goldsmith, who has lofty dreams that take him and his family far, far away from this place. More specifically, his son, Plutarchus, into the life of a gentleman. All this is to make you a gentleman! Oh, have you learned, son? I dream of having saved you at Oxford! Or at Cambridge? Or sending you to the Inns of Court, or France? I, I'm called for now in haste by Master Meercraft to trust Master Fitzdoctoral. A good man, I have inquired in 1800 a year. His name is current. Uh, for a, a diamond ring of 40? Should not be worth 30. That's gained. And this is to make you a gentleman. Oh, my good father, you trust too much. You don't wish to be a gentleman, truly, father. Oh, boy, by, we live by finding fools out to be trusted. Our shop books are our pastures, our corn grounds. We lay them open for them to come into, and when we have them there, we drive them up into one of our pounds. The cops is straight. And this is to make you a gentleman. We citizens never trust, but we do cousin. For if our debtors pay, we cousin them, and if they do not, then we cousin ourselves. Without the hazard, everyone must run that hopes to make his son a gentleman. Oh, Meercraft will be here soon. Ready? Big, gentlemanly smile now. <sighs> here we are. I knew he would not fail me. Good Gilded, I must have you do a noble gentleman a curtsy here. In a mere toy of fifty or three score pound, Fitzdoctoral is a good man, sir, and you may have seen him a great one. He is likely to bestow hundreds and thousands with you, if you can humour him. A great prince he will be shortly. What do you say? Uh, true, sir. I cannot. It's been a long vacation with us. Of what, I pray thee? Of wit or honesty? Those are your citizens' long vacations. Good father, do not trust him. Nay, Tom Gilthead, you will not buy a courtesy and beg it. He'll rather pay than pray. If you do for him, you must do cheerfully. His credit, sir, is not yet prostitute. Who's this? Thy son? A pretty youth. What's his name? Plutarchus. Sir. Plutarchus? How came that about? Oh, what a handsome young oh, man. Please, sir, get off. Oh, that year, sir, that I begot him, I bought Plutarch's lives and fell so in love with the book and so I called my son by his name in hopes he should be like him and write the lives of our great men. But now I'd rather get him a good wife and plant him in the country. There to use the blessing I shall leave him. Out upon it, and lose the laudable means thou hast at home here to advance and make him a young alderman. Buy him a captain's place for shame, and let him unto the world early, and with his plume and scarfs march through Cheapside or along Cornell, and by the virtue of those draw down a wife there from a window worth ten thousand pounds. 
get him the posture book and his leaden man to set upon a table against his mistress chance to come by that he may draw her in and shew her Finsbury battles. I have placed him with justice either side to get so much law. As thou hast conscience, come, come, thou dost wrong pretty Plutarchus, who had not his name for nothing, but was born to train the youth of London in the military truth. That way his genius lies. But who should enter now but Evero, the cousin whose company Meercraft was seeking not even a scene ago? Weird. Neither of them seemed pleased to see each other. Uh, my cousin Everill. Uh, oh, are you here, sir? Pray, p let us whisper. Will you gentlemen please excuse my kinsman and I? Come, sir, my, my clothes are all at pawn. I had sent out this morning before I heard you were come to town some, some twenty of my pistols, and no one returned. Why I have told you of this, that comes of wearing starlet, gold lace, and cut works, you will find Godwin. With your blown roses, cousin, and your eating pheasant and godwit here in London, haunting the globes, and mermaids wedging in with lords, still at the table, and affecting lechery in velvet, where could you have contented yourself with cheese, salt butter, and a pickled herring? Satisfied with a leap of your host's daughter, thus you have frighted off all your acquaintance, that they shun you at distance, worse than you do the bailiffs. Pox upon you! I come not to you for counsel, I lack money. You do not think what you owe me already. I? <laughs> they owe you, that mean to pay you. I'll be sworn I never meant it. Come, you will project I shall undo your practice, for this month else, you know me. You are a right sweet nature. Well, that's all one. You'll leave this empire one day. You'll not ever have this tribute pay. Your scepter of the sword. Tie up your wit, do, and provoke me not. Will you, sir, help to what I shall provoke another for you? I cannot tell. Try me. I think I am not so utterly of an oar unto be melted, but I can do myself good on occasions. Good. Lay along here. Will consider it a debt half paid. Why, I do mean this, but what I do must not come easily from me. We must deal with courtiers, as courtiers deal with us. If I have a business there with any of them, why, I must wait. I'm sure, and, and though my lord dispatch me, yet his worshipful man will keep me for his slaughter a month or two to show me with my fellow citizens. I must make his train long and full one quarter, and help the spectacle of his greatness. There, nothing is done at once but injuries, and they come headlong. <laughs> All their good turns move not, or uh, very slowly. Hmm, yes. Strike in, then, for your part, Mr. Fitzdotterell, if I transgress in point of manners, afford me your best construction. I must beg my freedom from your affairs this day. How, sir? It isn't secure of this gentleman's occasions. You see my kinsman here. You'll not do me that affront, sir. I'm sorry you should so interpret it, but, sir, it stands upon his being invested in a new office. He has stood for long in, uh, oh, in, uh, as master of dependences. Master of the dependences. A place of my projection too, sir, and have met much opposition of the state. Uh, now see, that's the great necessity of it, as after all their writing and their speaking against the jewels, they have erected it. Uh, his book is drawn, for since there will be differences daily to us gentlemen, and that the roaring man has grown offences, that those few we call the civil men of the sword abhor the vapours. They shall refer now hither to their process, and such as trespass against the rule of the courts are to be fined. And In troth, a pretty place. A kind of arbitrary court twill be, sir. Now I shall have matter for it, I believe, ere it be long. I had a distaste. But now, sir, my learned counsel, they must have a feeling. 
No part, sir, with no books, without the hand gout, be oiled, and I must furnish, if it be money, to me straight. I am mine mint and exchequer to supply all. What is it, a hundred pounds? The harpy now stands on, on, on a hundred pieces. Why, he must have them, if he will. Tomorrow, sir, will equally serve your occasions. And therefore, let me obtain that you will yield to timing a poor gentleman's distresses in terms of hazard. By no means. I must get him this money, and will. Sir, I protest. I'd rather stand engaged for it myself. Then you should leave me. Good sir, do you think so coarsely of our manners that we would for any need of ours be pressed to take it? Though you be pleased to offer it. <laughs> Why, by heaven, I mean it. I can never believe less. But we, sir, must preserve our dignity, as you do publish yours, by your fair leave, sir. No, no. As I am a gentleman, if you do offer to leave me now, or if you do refuse me, I will not think you love me. Sir, I honour you, and with just reason for these noble notes of the nobility you pretend to. But, sir, I would know why. A, a motive, he a stranger. You should do this. You'll mar all with your fineness. Shut up. Why, that's all one, if twere, sir, but my fancy. But I have a business that perhaps I'd have brought to his office... Oh, sir, I have done, then, if he can be made profitable to you. Yes, and it shall be one of my ambitions to have it the first business, may I not? So you mean to make it a perfect business? Why, why do I take this course else? I am not altogether an ass, good gentleman. Wherefore should I consult you? Do you think to make a song on it? How's your manner? Tell us. Do satisfy him. Give him the whole course. <clears throat> First, by request or otherwise, you offer your business to the court wherein you crave, the judgment of the master and the assistants. Well, that's done now. What do you upon it? We straight, sir, have recourse to the springhead, visit the ground, and so disclose the nature, if it will carry or no. If we do find, by our proportions, it is like to prove a sullen and black business, that it be incorrigible and out of treaty, then we file it, a dependence. So, tis filed. What follows? Though I do love the order of these things. We then advise the party, if he be of man of means and havings, that forthwith he settle his estate. If not, at least that he pretend it. For by that the world takes notice that it is now a dependence, and this we call, sir, publication. Very sufficient. After publication now? Then we grant out our process, which is diverse, either by chartal, sir, or orventenus, wherein the challenger and challengee, or with your Spaniard, and your provocador and provocado, have their several courses. I have enough on it. For an hundred pieces? Yes, for two hundred, underwrite me, do. Your man will take my bond? No, no more, sir. What ready arithmetic you have. Do you hear? A pretty morning's work for you, this gilt head. Do it. You shall have twenty pound on it. Twenty pieces? I don't think so. You will hook still, gilt head. Well, shew us your ring. You could not have done this now with gentleness at first. We might have thanked you. But groan and have your courtesies come from you like a hard stool and stink. A man may draw your teeth out easier than your money. Come, we little guilt head here, no better in nature. I should never love him that could pull his lips off now. Ah! Was not thy mother a gentlewoman? Yes, sir. And went to the court at Christmas, and St. George's tide, and lent the Lord's men chains. Yes, sir. I knew thou must take after somebody. Thou shalt have a wife. If smocks will mount, boy, how now? No, sir, I assure you. Look on the lustre of this ring. He will speak himself. I'll give you leave to put him in the mill. He is no great large stone, but a true paragon. He has all his corners. Do him well. And what do you value this ring at? Thirty pounds? <laughs> no, sir. It cost me forty ere he was set. Turnings, you mean? I know your equivox. 
you are grown the better fathers of them lace. Well, where it must go, to where we judged, and therefore, look, you would be right. You shall have fifty pound for it. That, that, what? And not a denier more. My lord Fitzdotterell, because you would have things dispatched, sir, I'll go presently, inquire out this Spanish lady. If you think good, sir, having an hundred pieces already, you may part with those now to serve my kinsman's turns, that he may wait upon you anon, the freer, and take him when you have sealed again, of guilt head. There, thou just, the hundred pieces. Cousin of my dear Meercraft, here's your share for the office. Much obliged, my lord. Well, go and seal then, Sir Fitzdotterell. Make your return as speedy as you can. I will be back promptly. Farewell, farewell, good day. Come, give me. There's forty pieces for you. What's this for? Your half. You know, the guild head must have twenty. And what's your ring there? Shall I have none of that? Oh, that's to be given to a lady. Is it so? You will not part with the whole, sir, will you? Go to. Give me ten pieces. By what law do you do this? In line law, sir. I must roar else. <laughs> Good. You have heard how the ass made his divisions wisely. And I am he. I thank you. Much good do you, sir. I should be rid of this tyranny one day. With reference to your aids, <laughs> you'll still be unthankful. Where shall I meet you, Anon? You have some feet to do alone now, I see. You wish me gone. Well, I will find you out and bring you after to the audit. Slice, uh, dead engines share too, I forgot. Uh, this rain is too, too unsupportable. I must quit myself out of this vassalage. On Don Surly. Don Surly, to aspire the glorious name of a great man, and to be thought the same, makes serious use of all great trade he know. He speaks to men with a rhinoceros nose, which he thinks great, and so reads verses too. And that is done as he saw great men do. He has timpanies of business in his face, and can forget men's names with a great grace. He will both argue and discourse in oaths, both of which are great, and laugh at ill-made clothes. That's greater yet to cry his own up meat. He doth at meals alone his pheasant eat, which is main greatness, and at his still board. He drinks to no man, that's too like a lord. He keeps another's wife, which is a spice of solemn greatness, and he dares at dice. Blaspheme God greatly for some poor hind feet that breathes in his dog's way, and this is great. Nay more for greatness sake, he will be one. May hear my epigrams, but like of none. Surly, use other arts, these only can. Style be a most great fool, but no great man. And so, Meercraft and Injun meet in the night to engage the final piece in their grand Spanish scheme. Do you think they'll be surprised to hear that their actor has his own reasons for joining this scheme? How goes the cry? Excellent, well. Will it do? Where's this Robinson? Here is the gentleman, sir. Will only take it himself. Why did you so? Why? For Robinson, you would have told him, you know. And he's a pleasant wit, will hurt nothing your purpose. Then he is of opinion that Robinson might want ideas to. See, being such a gallant. Now, he has been in Spain and knows the fashion there and can discourse. And being but mirth he says, leave much to his care. For that, he has the bravest advice, you will love him for that, to say he wears chipinos, and they do so in Spain, and Robinson is as tall as he. Is he so? Every jot. Uh, sir, my friend Injun has acquainted you with such a strange business here. Oh, a merry one, sir. The Duke of Drowned, and his duchess. <laughs> yes, sir, indeed. Now that the conjurers have laid him by, I have made them bold to borrow him a while. With purpose, yet to put him out, I hope, to his best use. Yes, sir. For that small part that I'm trusted with, put off your care. I would not lose to do it, for the mirth will follow of it. And, well, I have a fancy. 
Sir, thou will make it well. Where must I have my dressing? At my house, sir. You shall have caution, sir, for what he yields to six pence. You shall pardon me, sir. I will share, sir, in your sports only, nothing in your purchase. But you must furnish me with compliments to the manner of Spain. <laughs> my coach, my guarda de duenas. <laughs> Engines your provador. But, sir, I must, now I then to trust with you thus far, secure still in your quality, acquaint you with somewhat beyond this. The place designed to be the scene for this our merry matter, because it must have countenance of women to draw discourse, and offer it is hereby at the Lady Tailbushes. Oh, I know her, sir. Sir, it shall be no shame to me to confess to you that we poor gentlemen that want acres must for our needs turn fools up and plough ladies sometime to try what gleb they are, and this is no unfruitful piece. She and I now are on a project for the fact inventing of a new kind of fucus, a paint for ladies, to serve the kingdom, wherein she herself hath travailed specially by way of service unto her sex, and hopes to get the monopoly as a reward for her invention. Mm. Sir, I have my instructions. Is it not high time to be making ready? <laughs> yes, sir. The fool's in sight, Dutchful. Away, then. Wait, I thought the actor was meant to be called Robinson. What's Whittapol doing here? So did I. Maybe that's his second name. Do you... Have any clue what's going on? No, not really. Come, we must this way. How far is it? Hard by here, over the way. And so, having sent a fine new ring to this wonderful Spanish lady, Fitzdotrell sends Pug along with Meerkraft to meet with her and the other fine ladies about her. But the scam is closing in fast on poor Fitzdotrell, and those same fine ladies are about to be swept up in it. Uh, sir, be the ladies brave we go unto? <laughs> oh, yes. And I shall see em and speak to em? <laughs> oh, yes, if thee behaves, devil. the women, tailbush on either side. Anticipating Meercraft with an introduction to a fine Spanish lady they've heard so much about. Ah, oh, Meercraft, you courtiers move so snail-like in your business. Would I had not begun with you. We must move, Madam Tailbush, in order by degrees, not jump. Why, there was Sir John Moneyman could jump a business quickly. Truly, he had great friends. But because some sweet madam either side can leap ditches, we must not all shun to go over bridges. The harder parts I make account are done. Now, tis referred, you are infinitely bound unto the ladies. They have so cried it up. Do they like it, then? They have sent the Spanish lady to gratulate with you. Ooh, send them thanks and some remembrances. And may I introduce the man-servant of Lord Fitzdotterell? Devil, these are the ladies, tailbush and either side. The finest you shall see in all of London. Charmed. Manly! Oh, how wonderful to see you. Ah, madam, so I'll take my leave. I thought I was to see Meercraft here alone. You shall not go. In faith, I'll have you stay and see this Spanish miracle of our English lady. Oh, let me pray, your ladyship. Lay your commands on me some other time. Now I protest, and I will have all feast and friends again. It will be but ill soldiered. You are too much affected with it. I cannot, madam, either side, but think on it for the injustice. Sir, your kinsman Meercraft here is sorry. Uh, not I, madam. I am no kin to him. We but call cousins. And if we were, sir, I have no relation under his crimes. 
you are not urged with them. I can accuse sir none but my own judgment, for though it were his crime so to betray me, I am sure t'was more than mine own at all to trust him. But he therein did use his old madness, and favour strongly what he was before. Come, he will change. Faith, I must never think it, nor it reason in me to expect that for my sake he should put off a nature he sucked in with his milk. It may be, madam, deceiving trust is all he has to trust to. If so, I shall be loth by any hope of mine should bait him out of his means. You are sharp, sir. This act may make him honest. <laughs> <laughs> if he were to be made honest by an act of parliament, I should not alter in my faith of him. And so the party sit down to tea, some of them reluctantly. It would seem that the ladies' tail bush on either side could talk the whole day long, but the Spanish lady is about to join them. Pearl, hoister shells, as I breathe either side I know it. Here comes, they say, a wonder, Sarah, has been in Spain, will teach us all. She sent me from court to graduate with me. Prithee, let's observe her, what faults she has, that we may laugh at him when she's gone. <laughs> that we will heartily tell Bush. Just now, I hear her on the staircase. Oh, me, the very infanta of the giants. Hola, ladies! Here she is, the Spanish lady. Never has such a woman been seen before. The whole room is stunned to silence before Meercroft speaks. Here is a noble lady, madam. Come, for your great friends at court to see your ladyship and have the honour of your acquaintance. Sir, she does us honour. It is the manner of Spain to embrace only, never to kiss. Please, excuse the custom. Your use of it is law. Please, your sweet madam, to take a seat. Yes, madam. I have heard the favour through a world of fair report to know your virtues, madam, and in that name have desired the happiness of presenting my service to your ladies. Your love, madam. I must not own it else. Oh, both are due, madame, to your great undertaking. Great? Oh, in troth, madame, they are my friends that think him anything. If I can do my sex by him any service, I have my ends, madame. And they are noble ones that make a multitude beholden, madame. The commonwealth of ladies must acknowledge from you. However... The Spanish lady wasn't fooling everyone. There were some of those in the room who could have sworn they knew her from somewhere. Hang on. I should know this voice and face too. Quiet! Let the game play on! They say uh, tis dangerous to all the fame yet well disposed madams that are industrious and desire to earn their <coughs> living with their sweat. For any distemper of heat and motion may displace the colors, and if the paint once drawn about their faces, twenty to one they will appear so ill-favored. Their servants run away too, and leave the pleasure imperfect, and the reckonings all unpaid. Pox, these are poets' reasons. Some old lady that keeps a poet has devised these scandals. Faith, we must have the poet banished, madame, as Master Iverside said. Master Fitzdotterel and his wife wept. Madam, the Duke of Drowndland, that will be shortly. Is this my lord? The same. And then Fitzdotterel and Francis did arrive. Madam, I am your servant. This is the lady whose prince has brought her here, to be instructed. Oh, please, you sit with us, lady. Oh, how, how gracious you are. Lord Fitzdotterel, that's the lady president. A goodly woman. I cannot see the ring, though. Sir, she has it. Dear 
Madame, this daughter, will you let us be familiar? How do you like her? Admirable. But yet, I cannot see the ring. But for the manner of Spain, sweet madam, let us be bold now we are in. Are all the ladies there in the fashion? Oh, none but the grandees, madame. Or the class train, which may be worn at length, too, or, or thus upon my arm. And do they wear chupinos all? If they be dressed in punto, madame. Gilt as those are, madame? Oh, of goldsmith's work, madame, and set with diamonds, and, and their Spanish pumps of leather. But I receive, Lady Fistotterer, a token from you, which I would not be rude to refuse, being your first remembrance. Oh, that ring, it's, it's beautiful. Oh, I am satisfied now. Do you see it, sir? But since you come to know me nearer, lady, I'll beg the honor you will wear it for me. It must be so. Thank you, my lady. I... And in that moment, Francis could have sworn she'd met this mysterious Spanish lady before. Sure, I have heard this tongue. Where, pray tell, my lady? The trust fits doctoral to ruin the moment. I do not love to be gulled, though in a toy. Wife, do you hear? You are coming to the school, wife, where you may learn, I do perceive it, anything and how to be fine or fair or great or proud or, or what you will indeed wife here tis taught and i am glad on it that you may not say another day when honours come upon you you wanted means i had done my parts been today at fifty pound charge first for a ring to get you entered then to wait upon you here to see it confirmed that i may say both to mine own eyes and ears, senses, you are my witness. She hath enjoyed all helps that could be had for love or money. To make a fool of her. Wife, that's your malice, the wickedness of your nature to interpret your husband's kindness thus. But I'll not leave still to do good for your depraved affections. Intend it. Bend this stubborn will. Be great. And you would have your wife such. Yes, madam. Airy. Light. Not to plain dishonesty, I mean, but somewhat of this side. I'll take you, sir. Yes, reason, lady. I'll not give this thrust for any lady that cannot be honest within a thread. Yes, madam. And yet ventures far for the other in her fame. As can be. Courtship to Pimlico. Dance to Saravand. Hear and talk a body. <laughs> Laugh as loud as a larum. Speak. Squeak. Spring do anything. In young company, madame. Oh, oh, gallants, if they be brave, or lords, a woman is engaged. I say so, ladies. It is civility to deny us nothing. Hug has been keeping quiet all this time and has had just about enough of this. But then she must not lose a look on stuffs or cloth, madame. Nor no coarse fellow. She must be guided, madame. By the clothes he wear and the company he is in, whom to salute, how far he must go. I had told her this, and how that bawdry too upon the point is a civil discourse. And then any other affair of flesh whatsoever. But she will ne'er be capable. She is not so much as coming, madam. I know not how she loses all her opportunities. Devil, step forward. Oh, for the love of... Now! I have entertained a gentleman, a younger brother, here, whom I would fain breed up her escudero against some expectations that I have, and she'll not countenance him. What's his name? Devil, a Derbyshire. Glitter from him. Devil, call him Deville. What you please, ladies. Deville's a prettier Let's name. hear him. Can he manage? I please you to try him, ladies. Stand forth. Devil. Oh, was all this but the preface to my torment? Come, let their ladyship see your honours. Oh, he makes a wicked lag. As ever I saw. Fit for a devil. Good madam, call him Devil. Oh, chief, call me to hell again and free me. You murmur now. Not I, sir. Now give us the other leg. <laughs>
Uh, who, coming from hell, could look for such catechizing? The devil is an ass. I do acknowledge it. And it is with this that Fitzdatchel left the company to go on his way, leaving his manservant and wife in such fine company. But a certain woman remained with him. <gasps> the top of woman! All her sex in abstract! Oh, I love her! To each syllable falls from her! Yes, Fitzdatchel had fallen in love with the Spanish lady, our own Whittipole. And this, as time went on, was not something Meercraft and Manly failed to notice. And when the three conmen thought themselves alone... Oh, friend, forsake not the brave occasion virtue offers you to keep you innocent. I have feared for both and watched you to prevent the ill I feared. But since the weaker side hath so assured me, let not the stronger fall by his own vice, or be less a friend, cause virtue needs him. Virtue shall never ask my succours twice. Most friend, most man, your counsels are commands. Are you hearing this? <laughs> Lady, I cannot love goodness in you more than I did beauty, and I do here entitle your virtue to the power upon your life. You shall engage in any fruitful service, even to forfeit. <laughs> oh, even to forfeit. <laughs> boys, boys, we have another leg strained for this dottero. He has a quarrel to carry and has caused a deed of fiofment of his whole estate to be drawn yonder. He has it within, and you, Whittipole, he has fallen so desperately enamoured on you, and talks most like a madman. You did never hear a frantic and so in love with his own favour. Now, you do know it is of no validity in your name as you stand, therefore advise him to put in one of us. <gasps> it did appear the game was up. But even in his Spanish garb, Whittipal knew how to sweet talk the ladies. Be not afraid, sweet lady. You are trusted to love, not violence here. I am no ravisher, but one whom you, by your fair trust again, may of a servant make a most true friend. And such a one I need, but not this way. Sir, I confess me to you, the mere manner of you attempted me this morning took me. And I did home and venture, and my manners were both engaged to give it a requital, but not unto your ends. My hope was then, though interrupted ere it could be uttered, that whom I found the master of such language, that brain and spirit for such an enterprise could not. But if those succours were demanded to a right use, employ them virtuously, and make the profit of his noble parts, which they would yield. Sir, you have now the ground to exercise them in. I am a woman that cannot speak more wretchedness of myself than you can read, matched to a mass of folly that every day makes haste to his own ruin, the wealthy portion that I brought him spent, and, through my friend's neglect, no jointure made me. My fortune standing in this precipice, his counsel that I want and honour states, and in this name I need you for a friend, never in any other, for his ill must not make me so worse. My Picture Left in Scotland I now think love is rather deaf than blind, for else it could not be that she whom I adore so much should so slight me and cast my love behind. I'm sure my language to her was as sweet, and every close did meet in sentence of a subtle feet, as hath the youngest he that sits in shadow of Apollo's tree. Oh, but my conscious fears that fly my thoughts between, Tell me that she hath seen my hundred of grey hairs, Told seven and forty years read so much waste, As she cannot embrace my mountain belly and my rocky face. And all these, through her eyes, have stopped her ears. And so everyone is in the know, Except for poor Fitzdatchel, who is too far gone to care. Here he is now, walking his fine Spanish lady in the park, with poor old Pug trailing on behind. 
do stop throwing stones at the ducks, devil. <clears throat> Madam, I have a suit to you, and aforehand I do bespeak, you must not deny me, I will be granted. Sir, I must know it, though. No, lady, you must not know it. Yet you must, too, for the trust of it, and the fame indeed, which else were lost me. I would use your name, but in a fiefment, make my whole estate over unto you. A, a trifle, a thing of nothing, some eighteen hundred. Oh, alas! I understand not those things, sir. I am a woman, and most loath to embark myself. You will not slight me, madam? Nor you'll not quarrel me? No, sweet madam, I have already a dependence, for which cause I do this. Let me put you in, dear madam. I may be fairly killed. You have your friends, sir, about you here for choice. Why, sir, before the trust you'll let me have the honour to nail you one. Whist? Um, how about uh, Whittlepole? Oh, no, sweet madam. That young Whittapole would have debauched my wife and made me cuckold through a casement. He did fly her home to mine own window, but I think I fought him and ravished her away out of his pounces. I have sworn to hang by the ears. I fear the toy will not do me right. Really? Yes. What a scoundrel. Quite. Well, then, I might suggest another. What is his name? His name is Eustace Manley. Whence does he write himself? Of uh, Middlesex, Esquire. <laughs> Say nothing, madam. Devil, come hither. Now, devil. All right, all right, I'm coming. Write Eustace Manley, Squire of Middlesex, devil. Oh, look. Here come Meercraft and Manly now. How convenient. Why, I could have sworn this were planned. <laughs> what have you done, sir? Named a gentleman that I'll be answerable for to you, sir. Had I named you, it might have been suspected. This way to safe. Come, gentlemen, your hands for witness. What is this? Why, it is your name on the trust as recommended by my dear lady here. <laughs> when did you see young Whittapole, hmm? I am ready for process now. Sir, this is publication. He shall hear from me. He would needs be courting my wife, sir. No, that were a pity. What right do you ask, sir? Here he is. We'll do it, you. Whittipole? <laughs> Aye, sir. No more lady now, nor Spaniard. No, indeed, tis Whittipole. You knew. Both of you. Don't be so daft, man. Of course we knew. Am I the thing I feared? <laughs> A cockold? No, sir. But you are late in possibility, I'll tell you so much. But your wife's too virtuous. We'll see her, sir, at home, and leave you here to be made Duke of Shoreditch with a project. Thieves! Ravishers! Cry but another note, sir. I'll mar the tune of your pipe. Give me my deed, then. Neither. That will be kept for your wife's good, who will know better how to use it. Ha! <laughs> to feast you with my land. Sir, be you quiet, or I shall gag you ere I go. Consult your master of dependencies how to make this a second business. You have time, sir. Oh, what will the ghost of my wise grandfather, my learned father with my worshipful mother, think of me now, that left me in this world in state to be their heir, that I'm become a cuckold and an ass and my wife's ward, and like me to lose my land, have my throat cut, all by her practice? Sir, we are all abused. And be so still. Who hinders you, I pray you? Let me alone. I would enjoy myself and be the Duke of Drowned Lala Land you have made me. Sir, we must play an after game of this. But I am not in case to be a gamester. I tell you once again... You must be ruled. 
and take some counsel. Oh, sir, I do hate counsel, as I do hate my wife, my wicked wife. But we may think how to recover all, if you will act. I will not think, nor act, nor yet recover. Do not talk to me. I'll run out of my wits rather than hear. I will be what I am, Fabian Fitzdotteral, though all the world say nay to it. But wait! Ah, uh, uh, there he goes. This is not the last you'll hear of me. So, uh, what I miss? And so, friendless and penniless, Fitzdotterell is left with nothing at all. But the enemy of your enemy is your friend, and so our unlucky Fitzdotterell finds himself teaming up with the unlikely sort in his efforts to recover his funds. It is the easiest thing, sir, to be done, as plain as fizzling. Roll, but with your eyes, and foam at the mouth. A little castle soap will do it to rub your lips, and then a nutshell with toe, and touch wood in it to spit fire. And we'll give out, sir, that your wife has bewitched you and practiced with those criminals and gave you potions by which means you were not compos mentis when you made your fiatment. There's no recovery of your state but this. This, sir, will sting. For it is more than manifest that this was a plot of your wife's to get your land. I think it. Sir, it appears. Nay, and my cousin has known these gallants in these shapes. Oh, how a man's honesty may be fools. I thought him a very lady. But this way, sir, you'll be revenged at height. Yes, faith, and since your wife has run the way of woman thus, you'll give her, well, you know. Lost by this hand to me, dead to all joys of her dear daughter. I shall never pity her that could pity herself. Who goes there? Uh, um, do you hear, Sir Fitzdotterell, pray in private? <sighs> A moment, if you please, Sir Everill. Fine. Uh, time is of the essence, mind. Well, what say you? Brief, for I have no time to lose. Truth is, sir, I am the very devil, and had leave to take this body I am in to serve you, which was a cut purses and hanged this morning. And I did kill some ducks, but, sir, let me not go to prison for it. I have hitherto lost time, done nothing, shown indeed no part of my devil's nature. Now I will so help your malice against these parties, so advance the business that you have in hand of witchcraft and your possession, as myself were in you, teach you such tricks to make your belly swell and your eyes turn to foam, to stare, to gnash your teeth together, and to beat yourself, laugh around and feign six voices. Out, you rogue! You most infernal counterfeit wretch! Avant! Do you think to gull me with your Aesop's fables? Uh, sir! Away! I do disclaim I will not hear you. But they say I'll have to go to prison, sir. For what? For the ducks at the park, sir. Out! What said he to you, sir? Like a lying rascal told me he was the devil. How? A good jest. And that he would teach me such fine devil's tricks for our new resolution. Oh, pox on him. Twas excellent wisely done, sir, not to trust him. Why, if he were the devil, we shall not need him, if you'll be ruled. Go. Throw yourself on a bed, sir, and feign you ill. I'll not be seen with you till after that you have a fit, and all confirmed within. When they arrive, keep you with the two ladies and persuade them. Sir, be confident. Tis no hard thing to outdo the devil in. A boy thirteen-year-old made him an ass but the other day. Lost by this hand to me, dead to all joys of her dear dosseral, I shall never pity her that could pity herself. Come. You have put yourself to a simple coil here, and your friends by dealing with new agents in new plots. Now come, bare your teeth. <laughs> Excellent start, sir. Poor Pug, to Newgate with him, to 
okay for the ducks. Will Hell take pity on him? Ere you are lodged, sir, you must send your garnish, if you'll be private. There it is, sir. Leave me. Were the ducks worth it, mate? I don't want to talk about it. To Newgate brought. How is the name of the devil discredited in me? What a lost fiend shall I be on the turn? My chief will roar in triumph, now that I have been on earth a day, and done no noted thing, but brought that body back where it was hanged out this morning. Well, would it once were midnight, that I knew my utmost. I think time is drunk and sleeps. He is so still and moves not. I do glory now in my torment. Neither can I expect it. I have it with my fact. Child of hell, be thou merry. Put a look on as round, boy, and as red as a cherry. Cast care at thy posterns and fur thee fetters. They are ornaments, baby, have graced thy betters. Look upon me and hearken. Our chief to salute thee, unless thou cold iron should chance to confute thee. He hath sent thee. Grant parole by me to stay longer a month here on earth against cold, child, or hunger. How, good iniquity? Longer here a month? Yes, boy, till the session, that so there may stab a triumphal aggression. In a cart, to be hanged. No, child, in a car, the chariot of triumph, which most of them are. And in the meantime, to be greasy and boozy and nasty and filthy and ragged and lousy. With damn me, renounce me, and all the fine phrases that bring unto Tyburn the plentiful gazes. He is a devil. And maybe our chief, the great superior devil, for his malice, arch devil, I acknowledge him. He knew what I would suffer when he tied me up thus in a rogue's body. And he has, I thank him, his tyrannous pleasure on me to confine me to the unlucky carcass of a cutpurse wherein I could do nothing. Impudent fiend, stop thy lewd mouth. Dost thou not shame and tremble? To lay thine own dull, damned defects upon an innocent case there? Why, thou heavy slave, the spirit that did possess that flesh before put more true life in a finger and a thumb than thou in the whole mass. Yet thou rebellest and murmurst. What one proffer hast thou made, wicked enough this day, that might be called worthy thine own, much less the name that sent thee? First, thou didst help thyself into a beating, prompt thee, and whiffed in danger to thy tongue. A devil, and could not keep a body entire one day. That, for our credit, and to vindicate it, Hinderest, for thou know'st a deed of darkness, who t'was an act of that egregious folly, as no one toward the devil could have thought of. This, for your acting, but for suffering why thou hast been cheated on, with a false beard and a turned cloak. Faith, would your predecessor the cut purse think you had been so? Out upon thee, the hurt thou hast done to let men know their strength, and that they are able to outdo a devil put in a body will forever be scar upon our name. And there were the ducks too. Oh, yes, there were the ducks. Oh, my master, what can this mean? Hell shall make you provincial and a cheaters, or board ledger for this side of the town. No doubt you will render a rare account of things, baning or itching, scratching for employment. I'll have brimstone to allay it sure and fire to singe your nails off, 
but that I would not such a damned dishonour stick on our state as that the devil were hanged, and could not save a body that he took from Tygo, but it must come tither again. You should even ride, but up, away with him. Mount, darling of darkness, my shoulders are broad. He that carries the fiend is sure of his load. The devil was wont to carry away the evil, but now the evil outcarries the devil. Want to give them something to remember you by? Sounds like a good idea. A piece of the justice hall has broken down. What? A stream of broomstone is here. The prisoner's dead. Came in but now. Huh? Where? Look, here. Slid, I should know his countenance. It's Gil Cutpurse was hanged this morning. Tis he. The devil sure has had a hand in this. Oh, what shall we do? Uh, carry the news of it unto the sheriffs. And to the justices. This is strange. And favours of the devil, strongly. Oh, I have the sulphur of alcohol in my nose. Carry it in. Oh, how rank it is. Him to the belly. Room! Room! Make room for the bouncing belly. First father of sauce and deviser of jelly. Prime master of arts and the giver of wit that found out the excellent engine, the spit, the plough and the flail, the mill and the hopper, the hutch and the bolter, the furnace and copper, the oven, the bavin, the morkin, the peel, the half and the range, the dog and the wheel. He, he first invented a hogshead and tun, the gimlet and vice too, and taught him to run. And since, with the funnel and hippocras bag, he's made of himself that now he cries swag. Which shows, though the pleasure be but a four inches, yet he is a weasel, the gullet that pinches of any delight, and not spares from his back whatever to make of the belly a sack. Hail, hail, plump paunch, O oh, the founder of taste, for fresh meats or powdered or pickle or paste, devourer of broiled, baked, roasted or sod, and emptier of cuts, be they even or odd, or rich have thou made thee so wide in the waist, as scarce of no pudding thou art to be lace, but eating and drinking until thou dost nod, thou breakst all thy girdles and breakst forth a god. And while Pug departed this earth for good, Everall duly summoned the lady's tail bush on either side to Fitzdottrell's bedside. With them came the good Sir Poole to judge the extent of Fitzdottrell's bewitchment. Bandersnatch! Her ladyship will quibble? No, but I am dead. Dead! Oh, stay steady, sir. Here, wipe his brow. This was the noblest conspiracy that e'er I heard of. Sir, they had given him potions that did enamour him on the counterfeit lady, and then the witchcraft began to appear, for straight he fell into his fit. What kind of fit? Of rage at first, sir, which has since so increased. Oh, good Sir Paul, see him and punish the impostors. Do you hear? Call in the constable. I will have him by. He is the king's officer, and some citizens of credit. I'll discharge my conscience clearly. Yes, sir, and send for his wife and the two sorcerers by any means. I thought one a true lady. I should be sworn. So did you, either side. Yes, by that light, would I might ne'er stir else, Tailbush. And the other is civil gentleman. But, madame, you know what I told your ladyship. I now see it. I was providing of a banquet for them. After I had done instructing of the fellow Deville, Deville, the gentleman's man, 
Give me some garlic, garlic, garlic. Hark, the poor gentleman, how he is tormented. My wife is a whore, I'll kiss her no more. And why? Mayest not thou be a cuckold as well as I? <laughs> that is the devil speaks and laughs in him. Do you think so, sir? I'll discharge my conjurer. And is not the devil good company? Yes, yes. How he changes, sir, his voice. And a cuckold is where'er he put his head with a wanion. If his horns be forth, the devil's companion. Look, look, look else. How he foams, ever, and swells. Oh, me! What's that there rises in his belly? A strange thing. Tis too apparent, this. Whittable. Whittable! And just like that, who should enter here but Meercraft, Manly, and Whittable himself? Oh now, what play have we here? What fine new matters? Oh, strange impudence, that these should come to face their sin. Did you mark, sir, upon their coming in, how he called Whittable? I warrant you I did. Let them play a while. Alas, poor gentleman, how he is tortured. And if anyone could see through Fitzdotra's lies, it was his good wife, Frances. Fire, Master Fitzdotra, what do you mean to counterfeit thus? Oh, oh, she comes with a needle and thrusts it in. She pulls out that and she puts in a pin. And now, and now, I do not know how nor where, but she pricks me here and she pricks me there. Oh, oh! Woman, forbear. What, sir? A practised foul for one so fair. At this, then, credit with you. Do you believe in it? Gentlemen, I'll discharge my conscience. Tis a clear conspiracy, a dark and devilish practice. I detest it! The justice sure will prove the merrier man. This is most strange, sir. Come not to confront authority with impudence. I tell you I do detest it. Horrible, most unnatural, abominable. Do not tumble enough. Wallow, gnash! Oh, how he is vexed! That's it. Now lie still. And what does he now, sir? Hum! He calls for hum. You takers of strong waters and tobacco, mark this. Yellow, 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 yellow! Yellow! That starch! The devil's idol of that colour! See! He spits fire! Oh, no, he plays at figum! The devil is the author of a wicked figum! In truth, our con men do not know what to think of this. And so, Manly attempts to take Whittipal aside. I speak you no answer, Reams. I had all innocence of man to be endangered, and he could save or ruin it? I'll not grant a syllable in request. To such a fool he makes himself. Oh, they whisper, whisper, whisper. We shall have more of devils a score to come to dinner. In me, the sinner. Alas, poor gentleman. Here, put you two asunder from each other. Keep them from one another. Are you forensic, sir? Or what great dotage moves you to take part with so much villainy? We are not afraid either of the law or trial. Let us be examined what our ends were, what the means to work by were, and the possibility of those means. Do not conclude against us ere you hear us. I will not hear you. Yet I will conclude out of the circumstances. Will you so, sir? Yes, they are palpable. Not as your folly. I will discharge my conscience and do all to the meridian of justice. Provide me to eat three or four dishes of good meat. I'll feast them and their trains. A justice head and brains shall be the first. The devil loves not Justice. There you may see. A spare rib of my wife, 
and a whore's pertinence. Be not you troubled, sir. The devil speaks. Yes, wis, night, shite, powl, jowl, owl, foul, trowl, bowl. Cram another one of the devil's games. Speak, sir, some Greek if you can. Is not the justice a solemn game to you? Oi, moi, cacodimon. Kai Triskadaimon, Kai Tetrakin, Kai Pentakin, Kai Dodekakin, Kai Mariakin. He curses in Greek, I think. Now your Spanish, that I taught you. Quebremos el ojo de burlas. How? Your rest? Let's break his neck in jest, the devil says. Di gratia, signor mio, se halte denari fata me ne parte. What, would the devil borrow money? Oui, oui, monsieur. Un pauvre diable. Diabletine. It is the devil by his several languages. Fitzdaff shall have them hooked. Surely he'd get his just dues. And he would have gotten away with it, too, had the keeps of Newgate not sought Sir Poole at that very moment. Where's Sir Poole? Here. What's the matter? Oh, such an accident fallen out of Newgate, sir. A great piece of the prison is rent down. The devil has been there, sir, in the body of a young cut first, was hanged out this morning. Every one of us know him. He's gone, sir, now, and left us this dead body. But without, sir, such an infernal stink and steam behind, you cannot see St. Pulchre's steeple yet. They smelt as far as where as the wind lies. By this time, sure. Is this upon your credit, friend? Sir, you may see and satisfy yourself. He's cured, raise God. <laughs> I don't know. I like him better this way. Nay, then. Tis time to leave off counterfeiting. Sir, I am not bewitched, nor have a devil. No more than you. I do defy him, I, and did abuse you. Everill put me upon it. Well, I wouldn't say put you on it. Merely suggested, is all. They taught me all my tricks. I will tell truth and shame the fiend. Sir, are you not ashamed now of your solemn, serious vanity? But these are cousiners still, and have my land as plotters with my wife, who, though she be not a witch, is worse. A whore. Sir, you belie her. She is chaste and virtuous, and we are honest. I do know no glory a man should hope by venting his own follies, but you'll still be an ass in spite of providence. Please you go in, sir, and hear truths, then judge em, and make amends for your late rashness, when you shall but hear the pains and care was taken to save this fool from ruin, his grace of drownment. Oh, my land is drowned indeed. And how much his modest and too worthy wife have suffered by misconstruction from him, you will blush first for your own belief, more than for his actions. His land is his, and never by my friend or by myself meant to another use, but for her suckers who hath equal right. If any other have worse counsels in it, I know I speak to those who can apprehend me, let them repent them and not be detected. It is not manly to take joy or pride in human errors. We all do ill things. They do them worse that love them and dwell there till the plague comes. The few that have the seeds of goodness left will sooner make their way to a true life by shame than punishment. Yes, and more. And I will be ordering of the arrest this gallant meercraft here at my suit. Me? You owe at your lodging two year and a quarter. Thou art not mad, thou foul constable, puffed up with the pride of the place. Do you hear, sirs? Have I deserved this for all my pains at court to get you a patent upon my project of the, of the forks? Forks? What to be they? The laudable use of forks that brought it to custom here as they are in Italy to the sparing of napkins that, that should have made your bellows go at the forge as is his furnace. I have procured it, have to sit in it for it, dealt with the linen drapers on my private BA, because I fear they would likeliest ever to stir against, to cross it, twill be a mighty savour of linen through the kingdom, as that is one of my grounds, and to spare watching. Now on you two, 
had I laid all the profits, guild heads to have the making of all those of gil gold and silver for the better personages, and you, of course, of those of steel for the common sort, and both by patent I had brought you your seals in, uh, but now you have prevented me, and I thank you. I like the fashion to this project well. The forks, it may be a lucky one, and is not intricate as one would say, but fit for plain heads of ours to deal in. Do you hear? I will discharge you. Thus the projector here is overthrown, but I have now a project of mine own. If it may pass that no man would invite the poet from us to sup forth tonight, if it this pleasant be, we do presume that no man will, nor we. And from us at the Lords of Misrule, good day, for a good play we hope we've made a case. And from us, goodbye, and stay safe. And wear a mask. Yes, please.